Hi everyone, welcome to this first video on differentiation. This is chapter 8 in the P1 workbook. We've got the uh, syllabus here of all the things that we're going to cover. We've got a number of videos coming up, uh, six videos on differentiation. Uh, just a little introduction here. Uh, of course, this is part of calculus. And calculus is probably one of the important topics in mathematics that you'll study. Uh, both now, going forward, and if you go on and do mathematics at university. It's one of the most useful ways of uh, understanding the world in which we live. And so I'll show you a little bit of introdu an introduction video here from Michael Starbird, who's a professor of mathematics in the USA. Welcome to Calculus. It's going to be my great pleasure to introduce you to Calculus, or take you through a, a tour of calculus during these next uh, 24 lectures. The reason it's going to be such a pleasure is that calculus is all around us, and calculus is something that we can all enjoy and appreciate. When we're driving down uh, with a car on a road, and we're, we're saying where we are at every minute, and we see what, how fast we're going, that's calculus. When we throw a baseball and we see where it lands, calculus. When we send somebody to the moon, which we do regularly, a calculus. When we look at the at the stars and we see the, or we look at the planets and we see how they orbit the sun, calculus. Calculus has been one of the most influential tools, intellectual tools for understanding our world that has ever been devised in the entire history of humankind. And in fact, during the last 300 years, if we, if we look at how we live differently now from how people lived 300 years ago, most of those differences come from technological and scientific developments and their consequences. And most of those were based in fundamental ways on calculus. So calculus is something of, of great importance. But what I like about it is that calculus comes from everyday observations. That it's something that we can understand in English. The fundamental ideas are things not that require complicated notation or complicated vocabulary, but the fundamental ideas of calculus, the thing that makes it work, is that it comes from looking at what happens every single day of our lives and just thinking about it very, very clearly. So the ideas of calculus were developed by Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz. Here we see some pictures of Newton on the left and Leibniz on the right. Pretty much uh, same hairstyle as it looks like, and though Newton was over in England and uh, Leibniz in Germany. Uh, two of the greatest mathematicians of all time. Uh, not only just for the mathematics, but for many other fields and endeavours that they were involved in. Of course, we all know about Isaac Newton and the things that, that he came up with. Um, the interesting thing about the history is that these two, after coming up with the ideas of calculus, spent a long time afterwards kind of arguing with each other about who came up with them at first. And uh, if you we look at the history books now, I think most historians agree that they kind of came up with the same ideas independently of each other at about the same time. But they did spend a long time arguing about who came up with it first. So these two mathematicians extended the ideas that were known for thousands of years from the Greeks to some new ideas. And I've got a little table here that shows you those advancements. Um, on the left hand side we've got kind of the basic stuff that we knew everything about for a, a long, long time. The slope of a line, the area bounded by straight lines, the length of a straight line, the volume of basic shapes. And using the ideas of calculus we can now work out the slope of a curve, the area bounded by curved lines, the length of a curved line, or the volume of curved shapes. In fact, any kind of shape you can think of that we can model with a mathematical equation, we can now, using the ideas of calculus, come up with the volume. This is very useful stuff. If you look at these two graphs of the distance traveled by two cars in five hours, you can see that both cars have covered 400 kilometers in five hours. So we can talk about the average speed of the cars being 80 kilometers per hour, 400 kilometers in five hours. So for the first car on the left, it looks like that first car is the kind of graphs that you may have seen in IGCSE 
But if you think about what's going to happen in real life, that's often not the way. Um, it's maybe going to look something more like this, where you're going to have a curved line where the car accelerates and decelerates. It stops for a while, then it accelerates again. Still covers the same distance in the same time. But we want to know what's the exact speed of the car at an exact instant of time. Not the average speed, but the exact speed. So using the ideas of calculus, we can, we can do that. It's called the instantaneous speed. If we look at this, we can see if we want to know exactly how fast the car is going at 1, then the slope of the curve gives us that speed. So I've drawn a blue line there. It's called the tangent to the curve. Okay, The slope of that line will give me the speed at that exact instant. Similarly, if we look at after about three and a half hours, if I want to know exactly how fast we're going there, that purple line there shows the, the slope of the curve, which is equivalent to the speed of the car at that exact instant. So as I've got here, calculus helps us study quantities that change. At the one that we're most familiar with is speed. Uh, objects speeding up and slowing down. So you'll see a lot of questions that involve uh, speed, but there is so many other different things that that change in our life. Uh, electricity, engineering problems, populations change, uh, the flow of fluids both in our body and in pipes, uh, economics, you know, the price changes, conditions change. There's so many different applications of calculus, uh, literally thousands of them. So this is just a very brief introduction and a very mechanical introduction in, uh, in a number of ways to the, the derivative the main idea here. So there's two ways that we can write the derivative. Uh, if we have a curve given as y equals the derivative we write as dy dx, the change in y of a change in x. Okay, that, These d's here come from a, the, uh, a delta, delta y of a delta x, and if you do some physics you know that delta means a small change in y over a small change in x. So instead of writing a little delta sign we use d, dy dx. If the curve is given as f of x equals, then we write the derivative like this, f dash x. That little dash there means we're talking about the derivative. So here's the rule that we use to find the derivative of a polynomial. So in this course, we're just going to look at polynomial functions. Uh, later on in A-level, you can deal with all kinds of other functions, but we're just going to deal with polynomials. So if y is equal to x to the power of n, n can be any number. Uh, then the derivative is given by nx to the n minus 1. So we bring the number down the front and subtract 1 from the power. Now what is this telling us? The derivative is a function that tells us the gradient or the slope of the curve, the gradient or the slope of a tangent to the curve, or the rate of change, if you like, the rate of change of this function y, at a particular instant of time. Okay, All of those things are the exact same thing. They are the derivative. So let's look at this basic example. We've got a, a, a function here. We want to work out the derivative. Really simple. 5x to the 4, we bring the number down the front. 5 times 4 is 20. Subtract 1 from the power. So 20x cubed. Bring the number down the front. So negative 3x squared. Number down the front, 14x to the power of 1. Now, this is 3x to the power of 1. So when we bring the number down the front, we get 3 times 1x to the power of 0. x to the power of 0 is just 1, so we just get minus 3. In fact, the derivative of any term with just an x in it is just the coefficient of that term. Okay, so if I have uh, 16x, the derivative of that term would be 16. Finally, the derivative of this number on the end is always just 0. Okay, so if you have just a constant term, the derivative is zero. So there's our final answer there for the derivative of this function. If the function we're given has negative or fractional powers, you've got to use the following rules here. Uh, there were rules that you would have derived last year in IGCSE. Important ones. The definition of a negative index and also the definition of a fractional index. And I'm going to use those two rules in the next couple of examples. Okay, find the derivative of y equals 3 over x. Now, before we can work out the derivative, we've got to have the x terms on the top line. So that's the first thing I've done here. 3 over x becomes 3x to the power of minus 1. 
Okay, this is x to the power of plus 1 on the bottom, so x to the power of minus 1 on the top. Now, once the x terms are on the top, now I can use the rule. Bring the number down the front, so 3 times minus 1 is minus 3. Subtract 1 from the power, minus 1, take off 1 is minus 2. And now just writing this with a positive index, x to the minus 2 becomes x to the plus 2 on the bottom line. Notice the 3 just stays on the top. Okay, so the minus 3 stays on the top, the x to the minus 2 goes down the bottom. This function here is the derivative. Part b, find the derivative of 4 root x. Okay, the square root of x is x to the power of a half. So I've changed, first of all, that, that form there into index form, and now I use the rule. Number down the front, 4 times a half, which is 2. Subtract 1 from the power. A half minus 1 is negative a half. Okay, so we've got 2x to the power of negative a half. Let's tidy that up. x to the power of negative a half on the top becomes x to the power of positive a half on the bottom. And I know x to the power of a half is the same as the square root of x. So there's my answer there for the derivative of 4 root x, 2 over root x. In some questions, you may need to do some simplifying before you can do the derivative. So for this question that has a fraction in it, what you can't do is just work out the derivative of the top line and the derivative of the bottom. That doesn't work. For this one here, what we've got to do is divide each term by the square root of x first. So we've got 2 root x, sorry, 2x squared over root x and minus 2 over root x. So split them up like this. Now let's use our index laws. We've got x squared over x to the power of a half. When we're dividing, we subtract the fractions. So 2 minus a half is 1 and a half. And notice I've written it like this, not as 1 and a half, but 3 over 2. So stick, when you're looking at powers, stick with improper fractions. Don't go to 1 and a half, mix numbers, stick with improper. 2 over x to the power of a half is 2x to the minus a half. So I've made sure all the x's are on the top line. Now I can use the rule from here. So for the first one, 2 times 3 over 2 x to the power of a half, so I've subtracted 1 off 1 and a half, give me a half. And for the second one, minus 2 times minus a half, x to the power of minus 3 over 2. Once again, subtracting 1 off negative a half gives you negative 1 and a half. Okay, tidying that up, 2 times 3 over 2 is 3, x to the power of a half is root x. x minus 2 times minus a half is just plus 1 x to the minus 3 over 2 is x to the plus 3 over 2 on the bottom line. And x to the 3 over 2 on the bottom line is the square root of x cubed. Okay, so there's the derivative. This function here, reminder again, is telling us the slope of the curve at any point x. So if I want to know the slope of the curve when x equals to this equation, which I've done here, and that gives me 6 and 1 eighth curve, the slope of the tangent, that's the rate of change of y with respect to x, 6 and 1 8 at that exact instant. Here's a different example where I'm asking you to find the coordinates of the point on the curve where the gradient is a particular value. So in the previous example, we, we wanted to know what was the slope of the curve at a particular point. In this one here, we're saying when is that curve have a slope of negative 1. Okay, so obviously this is to do with the derivative. The derivative is telling us about the slope, so the first thing I'm going to do is find the derivative. So, number down the front, 3 times the third is 1, subtract so 1 from the power, so we get x squared for the derivative of this term. 2 times a half is 1, x to the power of 1, so just x for the second term. And for the last term, remember if you've just got an x term, it's the number in front of the x, that's the derivative. So it gives me x squared plus x minus 3, that's the derivative. And I want to know when that thing there, the slope of the curve, that's the derivative, when that is equal to minus 1. Okay, so we've got a little quadratic equation to solve. Adding 1 to both sides, we always want to make these equal to 0. Factorising gives me two points, 1 or minus 2. Notice the question is asking for the coordinates of the points. So I don't just want to give the x values, I want the y values as well. So I substitute those two x values into the original equation. Okay, this is giving me the y values for every x value. So I put uh, 1 in there, which gives me negative 13 over 6. And then I put negative 2 in there, which gives me 16 over 3. So that's the coordinates of the two points where the slope is negative 1. If we have a look at the picture of this curve, 
This is a cubic, you don't have to know the picture, but just to show you how this works. So you can see the slope at negative two is negative one, that blue line there, and the slope at positive one is also negative one. 